All right, day 10 here. We've got Cash and Jake, they're putting on fascia boards. And uh, had a few questions on the purlins on edge, how we handle the overlaps. So one purlin will cover three trusses. So you see this purlin right here covers three trusses. That truss, this truss, and this truss. And then the next purlin will overlap a minimum of one foot this way and one foot this way. They both get a 60D nail, and then you either nail or screw them together. I think I have um, screws in here. Um, and the next question is, is, well, doesn't that make your screws not in line? And yeah, that is true. So you'll have roughly 16 feet of screws in a line, and then they'll drop down an inch and a half. And you can't notice that. Um, even on a one story, uh, nobody's ever going to notice that and it doesn't look bad because the screws that are there are in a straight line. So the only difference um, when we run these on edge is the bottom one. So right here, I'll keep in a straight line. So what I'll do is I'll make a splice. I'll take a two foot board, cut the purlin so they sit half on the truss and they'll get screwed into the splice. The splice will get uh, 60D nailed to the truss. And this is so when we put our snow bars on that all of those uh, screws on one side of the snow bar, um, I can assure will go in to a purlin. And then I do the same thing in the top. Um, the very top uh, board where um, our ridge cap gets screwed into is done the same way. It'll get, the purlins will get cut so they are centered on the truss and then I'll put a splice in. That way all of my screws going through my ridge cap go into a purlin. Now if you sheathe your roof, um, I will still measure out and line the screws up to go through the sheathing into the purlins. Um, I just like doing that. However, if you do miss a purlin, it's not that big of a deal because you have sheathing. Um, if you miss a purlin here, you have to take a block of wood, put it up underneath so that that washer can seal. If you just go straight through the metal, um, it won't seal and it'll leak. So um, I have a pretty good process on the roof where we don't miss. Um, you know, it takes a little longer because you got to mark out all of your screw holes, but it works pretty good and very rarely do we have a mess. So um, the guys are finishing up putting fascia boards on. Um, I'm gonna start uh, making sure all our four corners are plumb both ways. And then uh, I'm gonna get ready for squaring the roof and getting the roof steel on. So hopefully by the end of the mar tomorrow, all of the roof steel will be on this, uh, on this building. And just looking at this fascia, um, it looks like it's gonna end up being pretty straight I'm um, just starting out, so I have to do a little tweaking, but not much. We are out here with the birds. It's day 11. Got ready for steel about noon yesterday, but it was just too windy. Lost a piece of steel. So we decided to get out here at daybreak, daylight. So that's what we're doing. Try to knock this uh, at least one side of the roof out before it gets too windy. Hopefully two sides, but we'll see.
One thing I want to talk about with this roof steel, if you're not going to put sheathing on your roof, especially if this is going to be a home, um, I recommend one of two things to my customers. Um, one is either drip stop, which is what we're doing on this building, or sheath the roof. Um, obviously the drip stops a little cheaper and it achieves uh, the same thing. It keeps your steel uh, from any condensation issues, um, which you shouldn't have. Here in the Midwest it's pretty uh, few and far between as long as your attic space is sealed off. But if you do get some like really, really cold temperatures like single digits, zero or below, you can get some frost um, formed on the underneath side. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, the sun comes up and it evaporates. Um, and it's, it'd probably never be anything here in the Midwest where we are where it'd be a problem. But the further north you go, the more this is an issue. So to eliminate that, we put drip stop um, or sheathing when we're doing uh, residences. Um, so this is what it is. It's just like a, a barrier that gets adhered to the steel as it's going through the roll former. So um, you can see right here, if you kind of peel it off, it's stick, stuck on there pretty good. But it's almost, um, it's kind of soft to the touch. It's like almost like a felt kind of stuff. Um, makes it really nice uh, putting your, it makes it really nice putting your roof steel on for a couple reasons. One, it solves the kind of, condensation issue which is first and foremost the most important but when you're putting your roof steel on typically like on a taller building where you're not handing it up and these are 30 uh, like 31 foot pieces we're sliding them one at a time off the pallet so this also keeps uh, any scratches from occurring on the piece below which Typically, as long as you pull that piece straight off, you're good. But there are times if you get it uh, crooked or anything, you can scratch the piece underneath. So keep that in mind. Um, this is a really good product. It's about a dollar a linear foot. So it does add some cost, but it is cheaper than sheathing. Um, either way, uh, I think it's a great option uh, for those uh, who don't want to spend the money on sheathing. And um, that's what we're doing on this one. And I think it's going to turn out great. Well, actually, it has turned out great. Another uh, thing I want to cover, I get lots of questions on, is, you know, doesn't it look terrible if your screw lines aren't straight all the way across with these staggered purlins? And my answer to that is, you, you won't notice it. The screws that are in line are nice and straight, and then every third truss it either moves up an inch and a half or down an inch and a half. So it's consistent and that's what is important. Um, two, we screw in the flats. You can screw on the ribs or in the flats. I choose to screw all my steel in the flats because you're actually taking that steel and making it contact the purlin um, tight, which I feel gives it better shear, less chance that the building uh, can move and work those screws loose. Um, I've had really good results with it without um, leaks. I know there's people out there that don't like it, and you know what, that's fine. I I respect that. This is how we do it. You have free you have the freedom to choose what you want, so if you wanna go through the rib, you can. You need to use a little bit longer screw. You just gotta be really careful when you're screwing through that rib that you don't over-tighten that screw because what can happen is you push that rib down and it pops up the flats. Um, so that's a challenge of screwing through the rib. So either way, the problem is going to occur if it's not done properly. So just keep that in mind. Right, guys quick uh, get people ask me about equipment um, kind of on a regular basis so you see this uh, telehandler I do not own that um, but I rent uh, usually I'll rent a telehandler when I have a taller building where I need to just get up high enough to set trusses like the peak of this buildings over 30 feet 
got 30 plus foot long sheets of steel that have to go up 19 feet to the top of the sidewall. So that's tall. And I don't own own this equipment, but I've been I found a company called Big Rents about three years ago, and um, they've worked out really well for me. And the thing I like about them is they're a nationwide company. They they have thousands of partners all over the country, rental partners, and it's a simple, easy process. You can either get on their website, rent a machine, or I always call and I just tell them exactly what I want. They find it. They get it delivered, they arrange to have it, pick it picked up, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I feel like it's a reasonable value. The thing that's valuable to me is I don't have to hunt the machine down, arrange for delivery, arrange for pickup. It's quick and easy. Um, and honestly, I've had excellent, excellent luck uh, with them. So um, I think on every rental, um, a couple times I called at about two or three o'clock in the afternoon and I had my machine the next morning at nine o'clock to start my day. So just keep that in mind. Um, I think they're a great company. They've been uh, really good to me. I've had really good luck with the machines. Seems like all the machines they have found for me and sent to me have been newer machines that are mechanically sound, um, work really well. They're tight, um, taken care of. So that's important as well. Um, but sometimes, um, especially if you're going to DIY a build, you're going to have to get some equipment that you just can't um, purchase. If you can purchase it, great. Um, but if you can't, um, you just got to rent it because renting the right equipment for the certain jobs makes your life a lot easier. So if you guys are looking for a rental machine, don't be afraid to check, check out BigRents.com. Uh, All right, so that's gonna be a wrap on the roof steel. Um, hopefully that was helpful to somebody. Um, the roof steel seems to me like it's a little bit overwhelming just because you have to lift that steel so high, especially in a building like this, it's got 19 foot sidewalls, but um, it goes pretty smoothly as long as you get those first couple pieces on square. If you guys have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget, we have design services. Email us at design at mrpostframe.com. We have a Patreon for you self-builders, the people out there that want to build their own home. We cover different topics every month. Um, we have all kinds of things. So check out our website also, uh, mrpostframe.com. Um, thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button, and we'll catch you on the next video.